So measures of association, statistical tests, why do we do them in medicine? Why do we concern ourselves with them in public health, in epidemiology? And I think we can all agree that it has to do with improving the health and well-being of the people we serve. Um, and really at the heart of that, it's to understand oh man, the exposure to disease relationship. Uh, we do statistical tests to inform us on this association. If we relied solely upon anecdote and emotion, we still may be doing uh, estrogen replacement for older women, thinking we're improving their health. We may be doing all kinds of crazy things that aren't right. So we need to free ourselves from anecdote and emotion and use statistics to try to understand uh, this shared milieu. So some of the measures of association uh, we talk about, we think of them in terms of whether our data is categorical or whether it's continuous or whether it's a combination of both. Um, and this, you could spend years in school learning this. Um, and these are some basic measures of association. But today, I'm just going to talk to you about categorical data, specifically risk ratios, odds ratios, and chi-squared testing. Uh, you'll see here the term relative risk. That's kind of a generic term that means risk ratio or rate ratio. Some people even use it uh, to describe an odds ratio. Um, but if you want to be very specific, especially when doing research, uh, you want to use risk ratio or rate ratio. That's more specific than just saying relative risk. To a statistician, relative risk doesn't really tell us what you want. So I'm sure you've seen this if you've taken a stats class. We think about categorical data in terms of our A, B, C, D box, right, with our squares. And really that evolves into this two-by-two two table, sometimes called a contingency table, where we look at an exposure, some disease, and we want to compare them. Sometimes you'll see this, especially if you're going to take uh, classes on statistics, you'll see the exposures on the top and diseases on the side. Uh, sometimes with disease, you'll see that referred to as cases and controls. It really doesn't matter um, how that's made up. It just um, it doesn't matter how you make the table up, as long as you understand how it's constructed and uh, how you're going to use it. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is risk ratios. Um, we use those for cohort studies or clinical trials, uh, prospective or retrospective cohort studies. Um, and with these studies, we start with an exposure, um, exposure positive or exposure negative, and then we go forward in time. So the cases that occur are incident cases. So we have outcome occurred, no outcome, outcome occurred, no outcome, based upon exposure. So for the running example, our exposure is going to be quinolone exposure, and the outcome is going to be C. diff. So if you start at the beginning of time and you don't have C. diff, we're going to see who got quinolone, go forward in time, and see who developed C. diff. This is the heart of the cohort study. And because of cohort study and because of incident cases, we can calculate risk. So here, what is the risk of the outcome given the exposure? What is the risk of the outcome given not exposure? Well, those are two cumulative incident incidences or cumulative risks. And if you make a ratio of those, you literally make a risk ratio. Do you see how we call it that? So what's the relative risk or the risk ratio of the outcome given exposure? You just put in your numbers and divide. So for the running example, um, I made up some numbers. I put it in here. We get a risk ratio of 6.39. So the interpretation of that is people that are in the exposed group are 6.3 times more likely to have developed the outcome. Another way to think about that is people who receive quinolone are 6.3 times more likely to have de developed C. diff. Remember, these are incident cases. Now, we have an Excel workbook that's free to you all. If you email Kim, she'll email this to you. And if you plug the numbers in, if you find the tab on the Excel workbook and plug the numbers in, you'll get this output. It'll look just like this. And with risk ratios and odds ratios, you get confidence intervals. Um, and so with this confidence interval, uh, you'll see it here. It's, I think it says 10.31 and 1 point, or 3.96. So a special note about confidence intervals, and Stephen just touched on this, if the confidence value contains, confidence interval contains one, then we don't have significant results. So for example, if our risk ratio is 11.15, so more than a thousand fold increase in risk of C. diff given quinolone exposure, but our confidence interval contains one, we don't have significant results. So you'll see one literally is not in that margin. 
So odds ratios, a little bit different than risk ratios. We use these for case control studies and cross-sectional studies. So with odds ratios, or with case control studies, we start with the disease first, and then we look back in time for exposure. This is different than the cohort study. So we look back in time, was the exposure present, was the uh, exposure absent? So we start with people that had C. diff, those are our cases, then we find a, a group of controls that don't have C. diff, then we look back in time to see who had quinolone exposure and who didn't. If we make a table and put those in there, we can find out what are the odds of the exposure given the outcome? What are the odds of the exposure given no outcome? If we take those individual odds and we make a ratio of those odds, we've literally created an odds ratio. So we put in our numbers, and we can see here, with the same numbers we use for the risk ratio, our odds ratio is way larger, 33.33. An odds ratio can be really as high as it can be. Uh, risk ratios are bound by the data that you put in. The odds ratio is usually going to be larger in magnitude than the risk ratio. Uh, so this is a huge increase, and it seems unrealistic, but if you look at the original uh, tobacco lung cancer data, the odds ratios were like 28. So it's not unreasonable to find something like this. So that's how we got it. We divided down. With odds ratio, there's this beautiful symmetry that exists within the table, and you can calculate the odds ratios in several different ways. You can divide across. You can divide down. You can get the cross products and divide. They're all going to give you the same answer. So it's kind of... Uh, proofed so you don't mess it up. And so the strict interpretation here is that there's a 33-fold increase in the odds of being exposed given the outcome. Some people will tell you that because of Bayes' theorem, you can say there's a 33-fold increase of developing C. diff if you're given quinolone. And statistically, you can say that, but if you think about how we collected the data, that's not really what we did. We started with C. diff, we looked back in time for quinolone exposure, we developed an odds ratio. So another way we'd interpret it, say, in a presentation, there's a 33-fold increase in the odds of having received quinolone given you started with C. diff. And again, you get your confidence interval. Does the confidence interval contain one, yes or no? This will inform us as to uh, being significant or not. And then the last test of association is the chi-squared test. Uh, chi, because it uses the symbol chi, um, if you want to make your stats teacher sad, call it chi or chai, but it's chi, I promise you. Just call it chi. Um, and there's two types of tests. There's really three, but I'm only going to talk about one. But the two of the big three ones are the chi-square test of independence and the chi-square test of homogeneity. And what, we're, what the chi-square test of independence is going to tell us, is there an association between two variables, um, is there a difference between groups that were exposed and not exposed in the disease outcome, basically? Uh, the chi-square test of independence and the chi-square test of homogeneity uh, both use this chi-square formula. This is the general formula. You'll see other formulas that people use for chi-square depending on the situation, but this formula always works for a chi-square test of independence or homogeneity. <clears throat> so I'm not going to go in and show you how to do that. Uh, it would take too long, perhaps. Um, but what you do is you use that Excel workbook that we're going to give you if you email Kim. You plug in these numbers, and then you look for your chi-square p-value. And in this case, the chi-square p-value is less than 0.05, right? So that is statistically significant. So the interpretation is, and this is kind of a, a layman's interpretation, you would say the exposed subjects had statistically more outcome compared to the unexposed subjects. Uh, subjects who received quinolone had statistically more C. diff than subjects who did not receive quinolone. <clears throat> and if you look at the p-value here, it's not even registering. So it's way smaller than 0.05. Um, so if you're interested in this Excel workbook, there's a lot of different uh, tabs on it besides how to analyze data on a two-by-two -two table. Email Kim Buckner, and she'll send this to you. Um, and in closing, I, I don't know if anyone's touched on this, but... Uh, there was a famous paper written by uh, Sir Bradford Hill on the criteria for causation. And at the end of the paper, he was talking about the chi-square p-value, but really this is generalizable to statistics. He said the chi-square p-value is like fire. It's a good servant, but a bad master. And what he was really saying is that statistics are a tool, 
and there's a philosophy of use, and we can't just rely on statistics to inform us. While we use statistics to free ourselves from anecdote and emotion, uh, we can't just use statistics. There is a human element uh, that physicians or clinicians will need to use beyond just the numbers. So always keep that in mind when you look, when you read a journal article or you calculate statistics. Uh, you can't bow to the altar of the p-value only. You have to think about what you're doing and what it means, and is it true? And that's all I have to say about that.